Pastor Steve shouldn't have historical footage. <laughs> uh, so funny. Appreciate the humor in the announcements. It's always good to laugh in church. Truly, truly believe that. Hey, listen, today's, today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, we are going to just continue on with our series. We're not, I'm not preaching specifically on, on Pentecost or on the Holy Spirit, but I want to tell you this, uh, two things. For those of you who are interested, there is a, there is a webcast tonight at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and if you want to write down this phrase, Empowered 21. There is an event, uh, taking, there's events actually taking place all through the world celebrating Pentecost. And so if you go to Empower 21, there's one, our Canadian webcast is happening tonight at 6 o'clock. And I also want to let you know that coming July, we are moving into a series on the Holy Spirit called Third Person. We will look at, uh, we'll look at who the Holy Spirit is, His role in our lives, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, walking in the Spirit, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll be spending the whole summer doing some teaching about that, and so we will be putting an emphasis that this summer on it and looking forward to that. Well, friends, we're going to continue on with our series. Today's message is called Guard Your Mouth. And uh, this week, as I was preparing for the message, I was thinking about when I was a kid, uh, some of the crazy things that we would do, some of the things that just didn't make a whole lot of sense. There were statements and there were things that we would we would do that just just seemed kind of silly. For instance, if you were if you had a friend who did something to you that was incredibly offensive, you would you would get them back by threatening them. I don't know if you ever did this, but I would threaten them. My friend did something that upset me. I'd say, "Okay, you're not my friend anymore." And I, I'd give them this big threat, like that was the big deal. Like they, they would be so shocked, so upset that they would take back what they just did. Or, or if I didn't say that they were my, weren't my friend, I'd say to them, hey, we're never, I'm never going to talk to you for the rest of my life. And if that didn't seem to cause enough pain, then I'd say this, you're not invited to my birthday party. You know, just, you, just these, these kind of threats that would just kind of send them over the edge and, and make them sorry for what they had done. The other thing that we did when we were kids is we would have these dares. I don't know, anybody ever practiced dares when you were a kid? You, you dare your friends to, hey, I dare you to drink that, that mud puddle water. Or, hey, I, I dare you to stand up on your bicycle seat as we go down the hill this time. And so you would start off and you'd say, hey, I dare you. And, and, if, and if you were smart, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give in the first dare because you know that's just entry-level stuff. You'd move to the second level, which is, I double dare you. Now, now, now it's getting serious. As if you, by adding the word double, things got more intense. And then if that didn't work, if you were really smart, you would push it to a new level and you'd say, I triple dare you. I triple dare you. I mean, this is, this is where the situation is getting really, really serious. But friends, if you want to win and you really want your friend to do something, you simply had to say these words, I triple dog dare you. By entering the word dog into the triple dare, you brought it to the most high level of dare, and the individual could not back down. All friends around the situation would know that the person who had been triple dog dared now had to drink the, the muddy water, or else they would be considered a chicken. So triple dog dare. How about punch buggy? Anybody ever do the punch buggy? Punch buggy legitimized violence. You, you could go around and you could punch people and all you had to do when they looked at you with the shock on, your, on their face is all you had to do is say, punch buggy. You, you, you do it all the time. We'd be driving along in the bus and, and, and some kid would just punch me in the shoulder. Ah, what's that for? Punch buggy, no punch backs. Uh, two things, it legitimized their punch and secondly, it allowed them to be in safe grounds where they didn't get the punch back. All they do is say punch buggy. You know, you, you'd be in the school year, you punch buggy somebody. You punch them, you go to the principal's office. The principal's trying to figure out why you hit some kid. And he, he's, you're, he's standing over you and sa sa says to you, hey, why did you do this? Why did you punch that kid in the face? Well, sir, it was punch buggy. No punch backs. Oh, punch buggy. No punch back. Oh, okay. He, he's got a point here. Every, everything's fine. Go back to your class. It legitimizes it. Punch buggy. It's just that simple phrase. Try it with your kids today. Punch buggy them if you're, no, never mind. <laughs> Punch buggy. How about this? I'm rubber. You're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. The, the, these, were the, these were the statements you said when someone insulted you. You know, someone, someone told you that your mother looked like whatever. So, so somebody said something about your shoes or your clothes or, or said something offensive to you. All you need to say was, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. And it was supposed to make you feel better. This crazy little, this crazy little idiom was supposed to make you feel better. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how many times you said those words, it didn't work. 
it, 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 didn't really, it didn't really take effect. Because someone would say something nasty to you, and you would say those words, and you'd walk away really confident like everything's fine, but the truth of the matter is what they just said about your mom, what they just said about your clothes, what they just said about your looks, what they just said about your abilities, it went deep, and it hurt you. And, and if you're human at all, the words that cu- came at you when you were a kid and maybe when you were a teenager, maybe when you even got to be an adult, the words didn't just bounce off you and go off and hit somebody else. They stuck to you. It's like the, the, the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Truth is, names do hurt. Insults do hurt. Friends, no matter how we try to navigate around it, the words that people say over our lives have some impact. The, the, the things that people speak over us have impact on our lives. And they can be good things or they can be bad things. It's interesting that in Proverbs, the, the, uh, Solomon talks about this and he says this, The tongue can bring death or life. Those who like to talk will reap the consequences. The tongue can bring death or life. When that kid insulted you, brought death. When your mom spoke words of life to you, you felt good. When you, were, when you were at work and, and someone made some kind of insult to you and, and made some little dig inside, you, you, you just kind of laughed it off, but you went back to your office and, and you felt it and you meditated upon it, you thought about it, and it brought death to you. You felt down on yourself. You, you felt discouraged. You kind of walked around with your head down because the words that we speak are not just words. They can either bring death to a person or they can bring life to a person. And friends, because we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, this isn't just some kind of nice Dr. Phil statement. The Holy Spirit's actually reminding us that there's power in our words, that we have the ability to bring life to people around us, or we can bring death to people around us. And that's why it's so important that we guard our mouths. It's so important, friends, that we guard our mouths and we watch the things that come out of our mouths so that we are not bringing death to people around us, but we're bringing life. I want to talk to you about some principles when it, with regard to guarding your mouth. And if you want to start off with me, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9. The first thing we learn from scriptures about guarding your mouth is to cover up. This is what it says. He who covers an offense promotes love. Let me read that again. He who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Friends, I I, I guarantee you that no matter who you are, no matter how nice you are, and no matter how gifted you are, that there's going to be a point in your life where you're going to do something, or someone's going to do something that's going to hurt you, there's something that's going to be offensive to you, there's something that's just going to, it's going to be like they've stabbed you in the back. If you go through life, you, you interact with individuals, and people are constantly doing things that are unfair and unjust to us. They are constantly saying things that are, that are not correct. They are constantly doing things that are incorrect. And, and, and if you come into any church, you'll find that people will constantly do things that will be hurtful. They don't mean to, but they will do things that will be hurtful. In your family life, they'll do things that will be hurtful. And I don't know about you, but whenever someone does something that is hurtful, whenever somebody says something that I think is unjust, Whenever somebody says something to me that's unfair or does something that's, to me that's unfair, the first thing I want to do is I want to tell somebody. Anybody else with me? Uh, you, know, you guys are more holy than I am. I, I want to tell somebody. Someone's just told me that they don't like my preaching. Pastor Adam, can you believe this? No, I know you can't because that's why you're on staff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to go tell somebody. I want, I want them to hear about the injustice that's done to me. Hey, hey, do you know, do you know what this family member did? Hey, hey, do you know what this person at work did? Hey, do you know what this person said? It hurt me. It, it, it caused damage. It was unjust. They did this. They did this. And we look for people to talk to. We look so that people can, can rally around us and be angry with this uh, individual. We're trying to get a posse of people who can be angry towards the other individual. And the Bible says that we are to cover up the offenses or else we'll start to split up relationships. Now let, let me explain this. There's, there's an interesting story that's found in Genesis chapter 9. You remember the story of Noah. 
And Noah, Noah is a righteous man. God's looked throughout the whole earth and he finds this righteous man and he decides to preserve mankind but through, through Noah's family. And they build this ark. You, you know the story, uh, the, the, the true biblical story I'm talking about. He, he, they, they put the ark together and, and they've got Noah and his family and, and all the animals and, and they're, they're in this boat for an, quite a number of days with all these animals. And I mean, it's just, it's just not the ideal situation. But the truth of the matter is, is God saves their lives. The, the waters subside, and, and now the, the, the waters spread out to the seas and into the lakes, and, and God begins to uh, uh, organize the, the whole planet, and, and he begins to create some places of dry ground. And so now Noah begins to plant. He's, he's now on dry ground. He's come out of the ark, and he begins to plant. And Genesis chapter 9 says that Noah plants a vineyard. Now, now as the vineyard comes about and the, the fruit grows on, on those vines, Noah begins to create some wine. And the Bible tells us this righteous man of God begins to drink the wine and one day finds himself drunk. I can't fully explain it. I don't want to interact with that today. But the Bible tells us the righteous man of God gets himself drunk. And, and one day, Ham is walking by this, the, the day that, that his father is drunk. And, and as he walks by, he sees the tent. The Bible says that Noah's in his tent. Not only is he drunk, but he's naked. He, he's in a posture of shame. He's in a place where he's embarrassed. If he was in his right mind, he would never want people to see him in the condition that he is. And, and Ham begins to walk by, and he sees his father naked inside the tent. And what does he do? He goes and finds his brothers. He goes over to, to Shem and, and Japheth, and he says, Hey, guys, you got, you got to check it out. Dad is naked. I mean, he's buck naked. He, he is so drunk. I mean, he, he, he can't even talk. He can't even get a sentence out. He, he, he can't even stand. He's laying in his tent, man. It is so embarrassing. Can you believe the man of God, the righteous man of God, that he is in this state? Come on, go, let's go see him. And he exposes the shame of Noah. Now the Bible tells us that the two other boys, Japheth and, and Shem, they respond differently. I'm going to ask Pastor Adam and, and Pastor Steve just to come up for a second. And Evan, why don't you come up for a second? Evan, you can be Noah today. Just, just stand right here. Just, just lay right there in the center. Now, now, I know the Bible says he's naked, but I don't want you to do any mental visualizations, okay? But he, but he just is naked. Um, the, the Bible says this. You guys grab this. Face the congregation. Ra ra rather than looking upon the shame of their father, they take a blanket and begin to walk backwards. They know whereabouts the tent is, and they... Without looking at their father, they put, <laughs> they put the blanket on him. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And then they walk away. <laughs> do, you, do you see what's happened? The, the, two, the two brothers have this opportunity to do the same thing as Ham. They have this ability to, to stare upon the shame of their father. To, to stare upon the embarrassment of their father, to look at him in a state that he would never want people to look at him in. But Shem and Japheth choose, rather than to expose his shame, to cover it up. To cover it up. Thanks, Evan. You can wake up now. <laughs> Friends, every time someone offends you, you got the same two opportunities. You, you've got the opportunity to expose their shame to people. Hey, hey, you, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about what brother so-and-so did. Oh, my goodness. And you begin to talk about it with somebody else. You're exposing their shame. Let, let me tell you what my kid did. Let me, tell you what this, let me tell you how this person hurt me. And every time someone does something that's not fair, that's not right, something that's hurtful, you have the opportunity to expose their shame by talking to somebody else about it. But the Bible says that we are to cover up we are to cover up the offense. We are to take the blanket just like Sh uh, Japheth and Shem and we are not to look at the shame but we are to put a guard in our mouths and cover up the thing that is not right, the thing that's not fair. We are to keep our mouths closed. Oh pastor, it's so hard. I know, but that's what God's calling us to do. 
If we truly love the people around us, if we are truly filled with the Spirit's love, we will not go around exposing each other's shame, but we'll do everything in our abilities to cover it up. You see, friends, the Bible tells us that Ham, because he was so eager to expose his father's shame, that he was cursed. But the two boys who were willing to cover up, they lived under the blessing of their father. And I want to suggest this to you this morning, friends, that those of you who are used to not guarding your mouths and are used to exposing people nonstop, used to exposing their shame, that you are not living underneath the blessing of God. I'm, I'm not saying that God doesn't step in and bless you, but you have yet to, f to realize how much He wants to bless you because you can only live in His blessing as you cover people up, not expose them. Are you catching this? Church, listen to me. Please listen to me. There are going to be people in this place who will hurt you. There will be people in your workplace who will hurt you. There will be family members who will hurt you. And you have every opportunity to expose them by talking to somebody else about what they did to you. And you will act like Ham, exposing their shame, exposing their wrongdoing. But God has called us as a church to cover up the shame of one another. He has, call, he has called us to guard our mouths, to keep it quiet, to hold on to it so that we can preserve the dignity of people around us. That's what a godly church does. So if you're used to talking about the things that people have done to you, it's time to stop. It's time to stop. We need to cover it up not expose people's shames. First thing we need to do is cover up. Secondly, not, uh, turn over to Titus chapter 3, verse 2. Not only do we need to cover up, but we need to balance up. Titus chapter 3, verse 2 says this. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility towards all men. I want to look at the word considerate just for a second. It means gentleness. It means to present equitable words, fair words. The bottom line is this. It means to represent both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. To be considerate of one another means to represent the letter of the law and, to be, and the spirit of the law. Friends, there are going to be moments where you're going to have to confront somebody and speak truth to them. There are moments where you're, the words that, you're, that are going to be spoken out of your mouth are going to be words that may not be appreciated by somebody else. Because somebody who's not walking in alignment, somebody who's not walking in alignment with the things of God, who's doing things that are inappropriate, they need to be corrected. And that's the letter of the law, the correction that's in place. But what's being spoken of here is this, is that even though you, there are moments where you speak truth, you've got to preserve the spirit of the law. You've got to do it in a certain way that, that causes people not just to hear the words, but to hear your heart. You see, there, there are too many people who, who, who think it's their job just to speak truth, to just go around and just speak truth. Well, the Bible says this, this is what I'm going to say. Well, that person was out of place, so this is what I'm going to say. Well, that person offended me, so I'm going to tell them the way it is. And you've got the letter of the law down right, but you don't have the spirit of the law right. Because, friends, the spirit of the law is to make people better. And if all you do is speak truth, if all you do is utter the words that are correct, they, p the person on the other end of those words won't hear a thing you're saying. You see, the way you say something is just as important as to what you say. You, 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 ever, you ever have that happen? Someone comes to you, and, and I mean, they're fuming, and they just lay into you, and they speak these words, and, the, and you know in your mind that those words are true, but your heart can't receive them because the way the person said it to you? And somebody else comes along to you, and they, they say, hey, hey, Jeff, I just wanted to talk to you. Look, I know it wasn't your intent. I know, I know that your heart is pure, but I'm not sure if you realize. But when you said this, this is, this is the way I perceived it. And, and there's a few, I think there's some others who did, because I looked around at people's faces. Oh, I, I'm sorry. And all of a sudden, I hear things in a different way because the spirit of the law is there, not just the letter of the law. The way they're saying it is just as important as the words they're saying. When it comes to speaking truth to one another, we've got to make sure that the way we're communicating is as important as the message that we're communicating. 
I, I, you know I've coached for many, many years. This is my first summer not coaching soccer. It's absolutely killing me. I think I mentioned three times to Ainsley yesterday about how I miss Brock playing soccer. And, and, and I've just coached for all these years, and, I, and I've watched a number of things. I, I would show up at these fields, especially during soccer tournaments, and I, I'd look around and I'd hear like what, what, what sounded like the cops should be called in for. There would be these coaches who would be screaming at their kids, Johnny, get over here. How dare you miss that ball? I can't believe you. Do you not know that we've done this drill over and over and over again? What do you have to say for yourself, young man? And some little six-year-old kid. I, I don't know, coach. I used to play baseball. Yeah, and, they, you know, this, their, their face, their face is just crushed by the coach. And I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I've watched, I've watched the youngest kids get torn apart by their coaches constantly yelling, and I'd listen to the words that the coach would say, and the things that he was saying were correct words. The instructions that he, were, he was giving were, was correct, but he was screaming at his kids, and, and I wasn't just most interested in that moment. I would, I'd, I'd be interested in what happened afterwards. Because after that coach yelled at his kid and gave the letter of the law to that kid, that kid would go onto the field and play intimidated. Th that, that kid would be on the field, and, and rather than playing with like, confidence, that kid would, would have his head down and his shoulders up, and he would be so nervous, and he'd be constantly looking over his shoulders because he was afraid that if he messed up again, that his coach would yell at him again. And I'd watch as these kids stopped enjoying soccer. And as a coach, I, I pay attention to all this, and I think to myself, how am I going to coach? And I had a rule I'd have a rule that I wouldn't yell at any kids. I might, I might yell things out in the field and tell kids what, that they need to move in certain places, but I would never yell at a kid. So a kid would make a terrible play. I mean, I, we, we were in, a, we were in the, uh, the cup finals this one year, and I, and I threw the weakest kid on our team out in the field. And my, my assistant coaches were so upset that I was doing this, but I believed in, in letting the kid have some chance to be on the field. His parents had driven him to this place, so I thought it was fair. And this kid is, is running with the ball, and all of a sudden, he kicks the ball in the direction of our net. I mean, all the way down the opposite side of the field, he sets up a play for them. Thankfully, they never scored. And, I, and the rest of my coaching staff, I mean, they are ready to tear him apart. They are ready to yell at him. They've got the letter of the law ready to go. But my rule is you don't yell at the kids. You, 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 don't, you don't speak in that way. And I'd, I'd pull him in, and I'd say, hey, Aaron. I'd say, hey, look, I just got to talk to you for a second. You, gotta, you just got to pay attention. You kick the ball into RN. Testing. Testing. There we go. I'd say, hey, Aaron, listen. You, you, you've got to make sure when you kick the ball that you are aware of what's around you. I said, I know there's pressure on you. I know that sometimes you get nervous because kids are coming at you. But if you pass the ball in the wrong spot, then, then there's an opportunity for them to score on our nets. Do you understand what I'm saying, Aaron? And he, and he knew beforehand that he had totally messed up. And I said, okay, go grab a seat. We'll try to get you back on the field. And I've watched these kids who played for me. When I didn't yell at them, when I communicated truth in a gracious way, these kids would come alive, they would sit for a few moments, and they'd go out in the field, and they would correct the mistakes that they had made. Friends, I want to tell you something. Just because you have truth in your mouth doesn't mean people are listening. Just because you communicate the letter of the law doesn't mean that you're actually helping people out. The way that you speak will determine whether or not people receive the truth that you're speaking. And so when it comes to guarding your mouth, it's not just the words that you're guarding. You're guarding the balance of what comes out of this mouth. You're guarding to make sure that the words you speak are spoken with kindness. Now listen to this. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24 says this. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the body. I, I want to tell you this. As a church, we need to be dripping with honey. Our lips need to be dripping with honey. The words that we communicate with people, even if they're truth and even if they're corrective, they need to be presented in ways that drip with honey that bring health to the people we're speaking to. Don't you dare speak truth without the spirit of the law. Don't you dare speak truth with unkindness in your heart. If you are angry, hold back your words because you've got to have the right balance of the letter of the law. 
and the spirit of law. Are you catching this? Balance up. Number three, just turn over in your Bible to James chapter 1, verse 26. James chapter 1, verse 26. Third part's the bridle up. I don't even know if this is a real phrase, but I thought it fit my up series. James chapter 1, verse 26, look at this. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religious is worthless. His religion is worthless. Interesting. If anyone considers himself religious, if anybody considers themselves serving God, if anybody considers themselves a Christian, if anybody considers themselves as holy and part of the body of Christ, but does not have the ability to keep a tight rein on his or her tongue, he deceives himself and your religion is worthless. Do, do, you, do you know what the Bible's saying? It's saying that you can come to church, you can have all the right beliefs, you, you can serve in any type of committee, you, you can present yourself in godliness, you, you can look like a Christian, you can be in the church your whole entire life, but if you don't have the ability to control your mouth, your religion means nothing. Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> your religion's nothing. Your worship means nothing. Your, your service means nothing. If you can't control your tongue, if you can't control your words, if you can't control the stuff that comes out of here, then God doesn't really care about the rest of it. Because your words can bring life or death. And we're called to bring life into this world, not death. So what is he talking about? He, he talks about this, this idea of tightening the rein. Pastor Adam, just come here for a second. Tightening the rein. This is, this is a bridle. I'm not really sure how it works. He actually looks like something from a scary movie. <laughs> so here's the deal. There, there are two parts to the, to the, uh, to the bridle. There's the headpiece right here, which is what, which is what the, the uh, rider w will hold on to to pull the reins. Okay, so if we just flip this over. <laughs> you look way too natural doing that. <laughs> Oops, I should guard my mouth. Uh, and then there's this part right here, which is called the bit. And he's, I'm not going to get him to put it in his mouth because Henry Hubbard tells me that this has been in a horse's mouth. Although, if you, if, if you, if you were willing to do it all for Jesus, then you would put it in your mouth. <laughs> Just joking. So here's the deal. You put, you put this on the horse's head, and then the bit would go into his mouth. The, hor the horse is going along, and, I, and I'm not going to... I pretend I'm riding the horse. Just really pretend. And all of a sudden, the horse... The horse sees an apple tree off to the left, and he wants to start to, and he wants to start to go in that direction. What the rider would do would be to pull back on the reins, and this bit would would be in his mouth, and it would it would put pressure on the sensitive areas of his mouth. It would actually cause pain, and and this is this is the picture that, that's being painted here. That there are moments in your life where people will do things to you. You'll be going down the path of godliness. You'll be pure religion, doing the right stuff. And all of a sudden, somebody says something to you or does something to you, and you think to yourself, there's an apple tree. There's an opportunity for me to tell that person the way it is. Oh, no, they didn't do that. Oh, no, they didn't say those words. Oh, they're talking about me? Here's my opportunity to let them have it. And as we're about to say whatever we want to say, the Bible says that people who follow God will pull back on the reins and the bit will come into their mouth and it will hit the sensitive areas of their life to prevent them from doing this. You see, guarding your mouth is going to hurt at times. Thanks, Pastor Adam. It's going to hurt at times. The, the times where you've got to pull back on the reins, it's going to hurt. But I have a right, Pastor, to say this. Yeah, you do. But that's not what you're called to do. Yeah, but you don't know what this person did. And if I don't share my thoughts, then it's going to hurt. That's exactly what he's talking about. Pull him back on the bit in your mouth. Pull him back so it hurts, so that you know that what you're about to do shouldn't be done. And if, if you can't do it and it's going to hurt by not doing it, you probably shouldn't do it. You probably shouldn't. 
You probably shouldn't say those words. You probably shouldn't speak those words. You need to pull back on the reins of your mouth and say, I can't say this to the person because this is not the direction that God wants me to go. We need to bridle up. So when do we need to bridle up? When, what, when are those moments? First of all, when it's the wrong timing. There, there are moments where you may need to share something with somebody, but it may not be the best timing. But by the way, don't think that the first time you got, you're recognized, the truth needs to be spoken, that that's the moment it needs to happen. I'll never forget when I was working uh, at, at Lakeshore Camp, this one, one day, Rick Hilsden came to me after the camp was done. And he said, hey, Jeff, I just want to tell you, so-and-so uh, on the grounds was watching the sports program and said that it was a very weak sports program that year. Now, I was in charge of the sports program, but my staff member was, and I hadn't observed what was going on, and so I, hadn't, I, I, I wasn't aware that it was good or bad. And I said, Rick, why didn't you tell me this earlier? He says, because I know what it's like to be in the middle of camp season. He says, you're running with no sleep. He says, people are constantly critical. And he says, the last thing you need is your boss coming to you and giving you a little bit of correction. I knew, I knew that you weren't intentional on, on, having poor, on having poor sports. I knew that wasn't your intention. And I knew you would correct it for the future. I knew this wasn't the right timing. And so I thought I'd tell you later on. Friends, there are times that you so desperately want to speak something out and God's pulling you back. He wants you to pull back on the reins because it's not the best timing to speak to somebody. You, you think, I'm going to tell them, uh, this has been bugging me for so long, and you're not paying attention to what the Spirit's saying. And that person's gone through a terrible week, and you've just knocked the feet right under, out from underneath them. They didn't need to hear it at that moment. It's the right timing. Second time you need to bridle up is when it's unprofitable. You see, there are moments where what you speak will simply add fire to the, or add fuel to the fire. There are times where you will speak something out, and you may be correct. You, you, you may be right in what you're saying, but it does nothing but adds fuel to a, already, uh, a situation that's already full of fire. And all you're doing, you think, I, look at me, I have a right to say this. No, all you're doing is making the fire bigger and causing more damage. Sometimes, sometimes the, the unprofitable things that we try to say are things that are to the wrong people. Friends, I, I, I've watched this for the last two years. I watch people have conversations with everybody but me. Oh, well, it's really quiet. We think we can say whatever we want, and we talk to everybody else who can't fix it, but the people who can fix it, nobody talks to them. Right? It's not profitable. It doesn't help out, but it sure feels good to say what we want to say. We need to make sure that we're bridling ourselves if it's not going to create something profitable. Number three, we need to bridle ourselves when there's an unchecked spirit. When you are fuming, when you are angry, do not say a single thing. Because I guarantee you that in your anger, you're going to say something that you shouldn't say. Friends, i got to check this all the time. I, I'm telling you this. I'm confessing to you. In, in my home, there are moments where I snap I get angry with my kids, and, and my, in my anger, I say things. I'm not talking swearing or, or, or way out inappropriate things, but I say the words of truth in ways that I don't want to say. When your spirit hasn't been checked, when you are fuming, pull back. Pull back, wait for a bit. Maybe wait for 24 hours. Often the things that we're most upset about, all it takes is 24 hours, and then we can go, you know what, that wasn't really that bad at all. Check your spirit beforehand. That bridle yourself if you have an unchecked spirit. Number four is insinuating stuff. There are times you're sitting around with some people and, and maybe they're talking about some things and, and, and you don't want to speak out of turn. You don't want to say anything that's gossip or slander. But maybe you say something that's just insinuating. My cousin and I used to play this game when we were in Bible college. He, he would find out information and, and uh, things that he, he promised he wouldn't share with me. And he, he'd go, hey, hey, Jeff, I know something. About what? Uh, I know something about, about somebody at the school. Well, tell me. I don't know, this is the ungodly side of me. Tell me. And he'd say, I'm not telling you, but we can play the guessing game. And I'd say, okay. And, I, and, and I'd say, does it have to do with a guy? Uh, and as soon as he'd say, I can't tell you, then I knew that, that I was right. Uh, and I'd say, what does it have to do with a guy? I can't tell you. Okay, is it somebody on the first floor? No. Is it somebody on the second floor? No. Is it somebody on the third floor? I can't tell you. 
And I, and I keep asking the questions. And, and when, we get to, when I hit it on the head, and, and he'd go, I can't tell you. We've got to end this conversation. I can't tell you. We've got to end the conversation. He hasn't said a word to me, but what he has communicated has insinuated something. And friends, I want to tell you that sometimes the things that we speak are insinuations that approve of the slander and the gossip around us. It insinuates. We, we don't need to say it, but we are simply adding a little bit more by not saying certain things and saying certain things. And in those moments, the Bible says we need to pull back on the reins. Lastly, we need to make sure that we are bridling our mouth when it comes to things that are inappropriate. Let me ask you a question. When, when you speak, how often are you aware of the Spirit around you? How often are you aware that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? that God is right there in the midst of the conversation. Are the words that you're speaking the words that you would be comfortable saying if Jesus Christ was standing right there? Uh, uh, the, the, the information you're dispensing, the, the things that you're communicating, whether they're coarse words, whether they're rude words, whether they're sexual words, whether they're gossiping words, whether they're slanderous words, are those the words that you'd want to say with the Holy Spirit right there? Hey, Holy Spirit, let's, let's have a little conversation with this person. Let's go talk to Pastor Adam. Hey, Pastor Adam, I, I want to hear about somebody. Holy Spirit, come on, let's just join in this conversation. And when we begin to think about the fact that the Spirit of God is inside of us, that God is walking with us, friends, then we will immediately know whether or not those words are inappropriate words. These are not the words I should be speaking. And in the moments when we're about to say something that we know would make the Spirit of God feel uncomfortable, we pull back. We pull on the reins. We, we take that bit and we pull it in our mouths. Fr friends, I know it's quiet in here because I'm hitting on some real practical things. But I want you to know this. is I don't care how long you've been in the church, and I'm speaking this at me too. You can live everything about Christianity but not control your mouth, and your religion means not a whole lot. You, you can come to church, and you can tithe, and you can have been on a missions trip, and you can have served on the board. You can be the pastor of this church. But if you're not controlling your mouth, then your religion doesn't mean a whole lot because God is looking for you to be the dispensers of life. It's interesting that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that happens. We know it happens because our mouth tells us. God was trying to shift them from being people who spoke death to people who began to speak life, people who began to speak the things of the Spirit. We are to be people who speak life. We need to bridle up. So we cover up, we balance up, we bridle up, and lastly, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. We build up. Look at this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, everybody say only, but only, but only. Hey, you want to know what you're supposed to say? You want to know what, when you can let the guard off your mouth? You want to know what words you're supposed to speak? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. You are to speak words that will build people up. God is calling you to speak only words that will build people up. This church must be a church where the words that are communicated on a daily basis are only words that build people up. That the atmosphere when we walk in this place is, I want to go to CPC because everywhere I go, there are people building me up. There are people speaking words of life to me. When I walk in the place and I feel so down, I know that I'm going to walk into a place where people are building me up. In your home, that your kids would walk into your home and they'd go, I want to get home because I know mom and dad will build me up. When in your workplace, people come to your office because they go, that's a person who builds me up. You see, the words that were instructed by Paul is to build one another up. And he says this, he says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That word unwholesome means that which rots. He says, don't let your talk be like a pile of termites. Don't let your talk be something that rots people. Don't let your talk be something that tears them down. Don't let your talk be something that eats away at the, at the very core of the structure of who they are. Don't let your words be something that's going to let someone be, remain unstable. And then he moves on, he says, but build them up. And he talks about this idea of construction, about, about building something that's stable and that will last, build, build something incredible. Friends, I want you to watch this video clip so I can illustrate it the best. Throw this clip up. Hey, honey, going to try a new recipe tonight. 
tan-seared lamb chops with a Mediterranean sauce. Oh, my mouth is watering. Mm. That sounds great, honey. Uh, careful on the salt. You have a tendency to oversalt everything. But you are great at following instructions, so I'm sure it's going to be spectacular. Good thing it is just you and me, though. Sure wouldn't want to spring a new recipe on the company. <laughs> But I'm sure it's going to turn out perfect because you are perfect. And if it does bomb, I can order pizza again anyway. Awesome. You, you, notice in the, you notice in the video clip, every time words of life are spoken, her whole countenance goes up, and they add the sound effect. And every time words of death are spoken, her, her countenance goes down. Friends, I know, it's, I know it's a silly video, but you watch. You watch as you speak words of life out in that foyer. You watch the countenance of people go up. You watch as you speak words of death out in the foyer, and your, the countenance of people will go down. You watch as you speak words of life in your home. The countenance of people will go up. You watch as you speak words of death in your home. Their countenance will go down. If you want to see people living with confidence, people living in life, people living the way that God intended them to live, speak words that build them up. I, I, wish, I, had, I wish I had a bunch of sticks here. I, I thought I had too many props as it was. But, but I want you just to imagine if I had four sticks and, and, and I, was, I said, okay, look, I'm just going to build this house. And I just grabbed a few twigs and a few sticks and I, and I put them together and I said, there's my house. Let's, let's live in that. You, you'd go, that's crazy. That, that's not going to last. As soon as a wind comes, it's going to knock it down. You're going to say, hey, you need, some, you need some structural beams. You need some supporting beams. You need some, a solid foundation. You need to put a lot into it. You need to build a lot into it, not just a few things thrown together. Because if something's going to last, if it's going to grow to be strong, you want to be generous with the resources. Now, friends, listen to me. It's time that we would become incredibly generous with words of life. It's time that this church would be incredibly generous with words of life. That we would build each other up. That we would build up our homes. That we would build up those in our workplace. That we would build up our neighborhood. That we would build up people in our ministries. That we would build up by being over generous with the words of life. I, I know this is a government town. You probably don't get a lot of compliments from people at work. But that's not the kingdom mindset. The kingdom mindset is that we would be so generous with our words we would love on people and speak words of life. And I'm not just talking about frivolous, well, that's a nice shirt. Hey, thank you very much. I'm talking about coming up to somebody and saying, hey, I value you. I see life in you. I see every time you walk into the room that you, you bring such an atmosphere with you because there's so, so much joy in your heart. Hey, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I want to thank you so much for serving so well. Dave, I want to thank you for serving the sound area so well. Uh, honestly, you, you come in here early, yeah. I, I appreciate the fact that you are a man of meekness, willing to serve. You come in in hours that nobody else is here. You beat me here this morning, and you serve really well. I just want to thank you for that. You're a man of God. Thank you so much. That's the way we should be. I don't, I'm not saying that as an illustration. That's the way we should be, that we build people up. That we look to people and we're constantly finding something good. You look at somebody and say, I can't find anything good in, in their lives. Then you're not looking hard enough. Because friends, everybody in this place has something that needs to be complimented. Everybody in this place needs something that, that we can gravitate towards and say, that's amazing. You watch what happens. If you will guard your mouth, church. 
if you will guard the things you say and you speak life and you begin to build people up left, right, and center, people will feel so good about themselves, they'll start talking about it out in the community. No matter when ba- things happen that are good or bad, they'll talk about it out in the community. And they will start to come to this place because they know that there's not a whole lot of places in this world where they can get that kind of language, where they can get the words that will make them feel incredible. You start to speak like that in your home, you watch what will happen to your wife. You watch what will happen to your kids. You start to speak like that in your workplace. You watch what happens with the people who work around you. You see, we've got to cover up, not expose people's shames. We, we've got to balance up. We've got to speak the letter of the law with the spirit of the law. We've got to bridle up. We've got to make sure we pull back on the reins in the times that God doesn't want us saying certain things. But friends, most importantly, we've got to build people up. We have the ability to speak words of life into people. We have the ability to speak words of life into people. I'm guessing that there's a portion of you in this congregation who haven't heard a lot of life words the last week. Your boss tells you that you don't do it well enough. People around you maybe don't, don't give you the encouragement you need. What would happen if we spoke words of life? What would happen if we built one another up in an incredible way? What do you think would happen to the countenance of this church? What do you think would happen to the countenance of your home and your workplace? I dare say that God would show up in incredible ways. And people would begin to walk out in confidence in the mission. And they would do things that they never dreamed they could do because of the confidence that we've spoken over one another. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Guard your mouth, guard your mouth. Our mouth has the ability to bring life and death. Life and death. I like being around people who speak words of life to me. I hate being around people who speak words of death to me. Friends, let's be a church. Let's be people who speak words of life. Let's guard our mouth. Let us cover up. Let us us balance up. Let us bridle up and let us build one another up. I want you just to search your heart just for a second. I want you to ask yourself and be honest. Where are you at with your mouth? Where are you at with your words? Where are you at? you're searching your hearts, those of you who are in this place who maybe have never given your life to Jesus. I always give an invitation and even though I want to move on to the end of this message and get the response, I want to to ask you this morning, if you're in this place, you say, I've never given my life to Jesus but I sense there's something real here. I, I, I want to be connected to a God who teaches this type of thing. I want to be connected to a God who's willing to die on the cross for my sins. I want to be connected to that type of God. Because friends, Jesus Christ died on the cross, not for the good people, but for all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he has given his life that you might have life. And if you're in this place and you say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I want to do so today, would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around, just you and me. Just you and me. Is there anybody in this place? Just put it really high so I can just see, just you and me. Maybe you didn't have the courage to raise your hand. I'd really encourage you to come to the front after the service and there'll be somebody who will meet you here. And they'll pray with you. Congregation, as your heads and your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm not giving a big altar call because it's not at the altar where this needs to change. It's in the next few moments and this is what we're going to do. We're going to end in the most unusual way. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask you to stand up and I'm not going to go to the back like I normally do. We have our, our guest luncheon today. But I'm going to ask that you would just find people. And I know it's going to make you feel uncomfortable, but I want you to speak some words of life to them. I want you to turn around and I want you to speak something to somebody that maybe you haven't shared. I'm not talking about your wife, unless you haven't said anything nice to her in a while. But I want you to find somebody. I want you to say something of life to them. I want you to look in their eyes and see what that does. I want you to find somebody and just say, I want to bless you. I want to speak words that will make you feel incredible.
want you to find just one person, maybe two people, and I want you to walk out of this place building people up. See how it feels when we walk out like that. So, Father, as we conclude this service, and we're about to do the most practical thing, just bless one another with our words. I pray you'll help us to cover up. When we feel like exposing the shame of somebody, help us to guard our mouth and cover them up. But God, when we feel like sp speaking the letter of the law, we, we've got truth. Let us check our spirit to make sure that we're doing it with the spirit of the law, a balance of truth and grace. God, I pray that when we want to go down a road and say certain things because our nature tells us this is good, let us bridle up. Most of all, God, let CPC be a church where we build one another up. There are way too many people kicking us down. Let this be a church of life. Let this be a church where we speak words of life. Let us build one another up. And every time we come in this place, let there be anticipation that somebody's got a good word to speak to me. And let us come in with an anticipation that we've got a good word to share over somebody else. Let life exist in this church. Let life exist in our homes. Let life exist in our schools. Let life exist in our workplaces as we become your people to speak life, I pray. Lord, use us this week with our mouths. I ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Now, do me a favor, stand up just for a sec. All I want you to do as you're dismissed, and you can, you can, you can, I know you can buck this. I know you can just smile at somebody and say, hey.